From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft clothes for men and 1036 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Tonight's story, The Adventure of Shoscombe Old Place. And so once again, we raise the familiar brass door knocker of Dr. John Watson. Well, well, Mr. Stark, come in, come in. This is indeed a pleasure. I've been told we'll have to get along with a substitute for Mr. Harris for a few weeks, but I had no idea he'd turn out to be an old friend. I, uh, well, I wore my clipper craft suit, Dr. Watson, so it wouldn't seem too strange in this program. Uh, what's on the agenda for tonight? Well, it concerns the strange and slightly horrendous affair at Shoscombe Old Place, in which Holmes investigated the graves in an ancient burial crypt. Hmm, sounds promising. And unearthed the fact that certain bones had been disposed of in the furnace. Wow, my hair is beginning to stand up on end already. <laughs> yes, but the adventure began placidly enough one rainy morning. Holmes and I had just finished an excellent breakfast in our rooms in Baker Street. I was gazing idly through the sporting columns, trying to decide what horse to back in the forthcoming derby... And, uh, Holmes? Uh, Holmes was pot pottering around with a, a low-piled microscope, doing some sort of an experiment. Daredevil quoted his favorite, eh? Up and Atom, odds ten to one. Shoscombe Prince, forty to one. Huh. Wonder what's brought the odds down on that horse. Aha! Glue, Watson. It's glue. Jack Horner and Break a Day. I were, what did you say, Holmes? I was merely telling you the phenomenal fact that the microscope showed that there's glue in this bit of dust. Glue? Hmm. What difference does it make? Glue or paste or even sticking plaster? Well, can't you see I'm busy? Lucky lady. Pride of Cornwall. And... The fact that there is glue in this dust is going to cost a man his life. And uh, I say cost a man's life? Glue? Hmm. Now you're interested, eh, Watson? Well, come over here and take a peek through this microscope. Well, it's nothing but a blur to me. Wait, let me adjust it. There, what do you see now? Some long, matted hairs. Those are infinitesimal fibers from a tweed cap, the criminal's tweed cap. The irregular gray masses are dust. These are epithelial scales on the left. Yes, but what are those shiny amber-colored crystals in the center? Hmm? That is the glue. Yes, but how does a man's life depend on those? In the St. Pancras case, you may remember that a cap was found beside the dead policeman. The accused man denies it's his. The stuff under the microscope was taken from one of the seams of that cap and proves the man was lying. But how? The man is a picture frame maker who habitually handles glue. Well, that case is closed. I had a new client who's due to call at ten. He's late. By the way, Watson, you have some knowledge of horse racing, I believe. Well, I ought to. <laughs> It's cost me about half my year's pension. Good. Then you can be my handy guide to the turf, as I believe you call your racing Bible. Well, what would you like to know? Does the name Sir Robert Norberton mean anything to you? Oh, rather. He lives at Shoscombe Old Place. Yes, but the man himself, what's he like? Tall, muscular, has a devil of a temper. He once horsewhipped Sam Brewer, the Curzon Street moneylender, on Newmarket Heath. Hmm, interesting. Does he often indulge in such pastimes? Well, he has the reputation of being a dangerous man... The most daredevil rider in Europe. See, he won the Grand National a few years back. One of those men who have missed their true generation. <laughs> he would have been a buck in the days of the Regency. A boxer, a heavy gambler, a devil with the ladies, and a first-class shot. Capital, Watson. A perfect thumbnail sketch. Now, can you give me some idea of Shoscombe Old Place? Well, not much. Only that it's very ancient and situated in the centre of Shoscombe Park. And that the famous Shoscombe stables and training quarters are to be found there. And, and the head you... trainer is John Mason. I say, how did you deduce that? I didn't have to. John Mason's my most recent client. This letter asking for an appointment is from him. But uh, go on, what else is there of interest about the place? Well, there are the famous Shoscombe Spaniels. You hear of them in every dog show. Spaniels, eh? Uh, they're the special pride of the lady of Shoscombe Old Place. Sir Robert's wife? 
No, Sir Robert has never married. He lives with his widowed sister, Lady Beatrice Folder. You mean she lives with him? No, I am not at all. I said what I meant. The place belonged to her late husband. Lady Beatrice has only a life interest. It reverts at her debt to her husband's brother. Mm, her husband's brother, eh? Meantime, she draws the rents every year. And brother Robert spends them. Yes, that's about the size of it. They're always quarreling, and yet I've heard they're devoted to each other. But what's amiss at Shoscombe? That's just what I'd like to know. What the... And that, if I'm not mistaken, is the man who can tell us, the trainer, John Mason. Yes, here he comes up the stairs. Come in, come in. Ah, Mr. Mason, I am Sherlock Holmes. Good morning, Mr. Holmes. You read my note? Yes, this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, Mr. John Mason. How, How do you do, do, sir? Please be seated. Now, Mr. Mason, what's the difficulty? Your note explained nothing. The matter's too delicate for me to put on paper. Much too complicated. I had to see you face to face. We are at your disposal. Mr. Holmes, I think my employer has gone mad. My dear Mr. Mason, this is Baker Street, not Harley Street. We do not pretend to be brain specialists. Well, gentlemen, a man does one queer thing, or even two. But when everything he does is queer, well... I believe Shoscombe Prince and the Derby have turned his brain. Shoscombe Prince? That's the colt you're running, isn't it? Yes, sir. The best in England, if I do say so. I'll be plain with you, because I, I know you're a gentleman of honour and it won't go beyond this room. Sir Robert has got to win the Derby. He's up to his neck in debts and, well, it's his last chance. Everything he can raise or borrow is on that horse. If Prince fails him, he's done for. Hmm, sounds like rather a desperate gamble, but that doesn't necessarily mean the man's insane. Where does the madness come in? First of all, his looks, sir. His eyes are wild. I don't believe he sleeps at nights. He's down at the stables at all hours. Then, sir, there's, there's his conduct to his sister, Lady Beatrice. She loved the horses as much as he did. Every day she'd drive down to see him, and above all, she loved Prince. He'd trick up his ears when he heard the wheels of a carriage on the gravel, and... Out he'd trot to get his lump of sugar. But that's all over now. She drives by every morning without so much as a good day to you. You think there's been a quarrel? Yes. A bitter, savage one it must have been. Why else would he give away a pet spaniel that she loved as if he were a child? To whom did he give it? To old Barnes, what keeps the Green Dragon three miles away at Crindle. Hmm. Curious, eh, Watson? Yeah. Of course, with her weak heart and dropsy, you couldn't expect her to get about much with her brother... But Sir Robert spent two hours every evening in her room. Now he never goes near her. She's taken it to art, she has, sir. Brooding and sulky and drinking, Mr. Holmes. Drinking like a fish. Mm. Did she ever do that before this estrangement? Well, she took a glass regular every evening, but now as often as not, it's a old bottle. There's something rotten about it, Mr. Holmes. Then there's the goings-on down at the old church crypt at night. The... Haunted crypt, we call it. Haunted? Yes, Mr. Holmes. There's an old ruined chapel in the park. So old, nobody can fix its date. And under it, there's a crypt. A crypt where all the ancestors of Lady Beatrice's husband lie buried, including the man himself. Well, sir, that crypt has got a bad name among us. It's dark and damp enough by day with the weeds breaking through everywhere, but at night it's worse. Standing there in the moonlight, it's... Broken arches, gleaming like ghosts. There's not many in the countryside that have the nerve to go near it at night. But I gather you did, or there'd be no story. Yes, sir. Me and the butler Stevens. We was taking a walk in the moonlight, smoking a pipe before going to bed. When all of a sudden, we notices a light, sort of pale and unearthly like, shining in the old chapel. There we stood, Stevens and me, Quaking in the bushes like two bunny rabbits. You, you see that, Mason? It's a light in the old chapel. Uh, someone's in there. Or something. I don't like the look of it. It isn't natural. What's going on in the chapel this time of night? Yeah, we'd best go and find out. Oh, for heaven's sake, no. Maybe it's something evil. Some bad spirit set its light there to lure some poor fella to his death. Uh, wait a bit, wait a bit. See that shadow moving against the far wall? It's a man's shadow, that is. Or a devil's. It looks more than life-size to me. Isn't that a tail he's switching around behind him? Uh, nonsense. It's a 
piece of rope he's holding in his hand. Here! What's that? It, it's Pip, Lady Beatrice's spaniel. He's probably outside the old well house, howling at the moon. He was there all last night, howling to wake the dead. I don't say that. Maybe that's just what he's doing. Maybe that's what he's done. Waked all the corpses in the crypt and they're having a ghostly meeting. Rubbish, Stevens. You don't really believe in ghosts? Why, when you think about all this tomorrow morning, you'd be ashamed. Yeah, but that's tomorrow morning. And tonight, standing here in the moonlight, well, I ain't so sure. Well, there's one way to find out. Come on, let's have a look at who's in that chapel. You, you're not going over there, Mason. I am that. You can stay here alone if you like. Stay here by myself. Well, then, go back to the house. What? And pass by that well house and that howling dog all alone? It's only Pip. No, I'm coming with you. At least there'll be two of us. Right, start late. Come along, then. Don't crackle the bushes any more than you can help. Confound that beast! Hello. Light's disappearing down the stairs into the crypt. Ah, see? There's no one in here in the chapel. Oh, then what's the good of us coming down? Look, look, there's a crack in the stone floor. Over there, where the streak of light's coming through, see? We can get over to it without being heard. Maybe we can see what's going on down below. I wish I was safe in my bed. Now then, we'd best crawl along in our stomachs. Easy, does it? All right. <laughs> yeah, here's the crack. By George, you're right. It's two men. Uh-huh. That first one with a thin yellow face. I've never seen him before, I'd swear to that. But the big chap in the black cloak kneeling down. There's something familiar about him. If I could only see his Hello. face. Now, now he's standing up. By the Lord, Lord Harry. Harry. It's the master himself, Sir Robert. What's he up to down here in the dead of night? What's that he's got under his arm? So careful. Now he's holding it up to the light. It's a head. The head of a mummy. <laughs> What an eerie experience, Mr. Mason. Well, that it was, Dr. Watson. I'd have given me notice the next day, except that, well, uh, I didn't want to leave Lady Beatrice alone at the mercy of that ruffian. I tried to see her ladyship and tell her what was going on, but she wouldn't see me. Sent out word by our maid, Carrie Evans, she wasn't feeling well enough. Not feeling well enough? Yes, Mr. Holmes. But she was well enough to go out driving all the same. How long has this maid, Carrie Evans, been with Lady Beatrice, Mr. Mason? Going on five years, sir. And she's devoted? She's... Devoted, all right. I won't say to whom. I can't be creating scandal. You don't have to. Sir Robert's reputation with the ladies is, shall we say, a, a trifle shady. Yes. Scandal's been clear for a long time, I'm afraid. I say, Holmes, perhaps that's the cause of the quarrel between the brother and sister. Being an invalid, she has no way of enforcing her will. So the hated maid is still at Shoscombe. Lady Beatrice sulks and takes to drink. Sir Robert becomes angry and gives away her pet spaniel. That explains everything, doesn't it? Everything but the nocturnal visit to the crypt, who the yellow-faced stranger was, and why Sir Robert was holding a skull in his arms. Just a few trifling omissions, Watson. Oh, go to blazes. Quite. Now then, Mr. Mason, you say Sir Robert gave his sister's spaniel away to the proprietor of the Green Dragon. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When was that? About a week ago, sir. Day after we saw him in the crypt. The very day Sir Robert left for London. Oh, he left for London, did he? Yes, sir. And has he come back? We're expecting him back tomorrow, sir. And has Lady Beatrice been taking her morning drives the same as usual? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Eleven o'clock sharp. She and Carrie go out together. I'm not quite clear what you expect me to do with this matter, Mr. Mason. Maybe this will make it more definite, sir. Yes, I've been wondering what you had in that paper bundle. It's something Harvey. He's one of my lads. Found in the furnace up at the big house when he was raking out the cinders yesterday. Hmm. A bone. Badly charred. I see. What is it, Watson? Your knowledge of anatomy is more accurate than mine. That's part of a femur, a human bone. Exactly. When does this lad tend to the furnace? Every night he makes it up and then leaves it. Anyone could visit it during the night? Yes, sir. You don't think Sir Robert... Watson, you forget Sir Robert's supposed to be in London. He's a deep waters, Mr. Mason, deep and rather dirty, but I'm beginning to see to the bottom. How is the fishing in the neighborhood of Shoscombe Old Place? The the fishing, Mr. Holmes? Yes, the doctor and I are famous fishermen, and we haven't had an opportunity to show our prowess this season, eh, Watson? Well, if it's fishing you're after, there's nothing can... Come up to the trout in the mill stream. Good. 
You may address us in future at the Green Dragon. We shall reach there tonight. And now that you have Mr. Holmes started on your fishing expedition, Dr. Watson, may I step in to say a few words? Fair enough, Mr. Stark. Clipper craft clothes are not merely good-looking at the time you buy them. They stay good-looking. Part of the reason for this is hidden from your eyes. That's the painstaking tailoring, the hundreds of stitches inside. Yes, fine tailoring and rich, long-wearing fabrics are the reasons Clipper craft clothes are remarkable values at their more than modest prices. Naturally, prices low as these wouldn't be possible without the unique Clipper Craft plan. This plan concentrates the buying power of 1,036 great stores across the country, creating year-round economies in manufacturing and distribution costs. That's why you pay only $40 and $45 for a Clipper Craft suit, only $40 for a top coat or overcoat, and only $26.50 for sport jackets. For your own sake, compare Clipper Craft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to return to our story, Dr. Watson. Well, suppose we pick up after Holmes and I had settled ourselves at the Green Dragon. Mid-morning found us tramping down the road leading towards Soskamold Place, carrying rods and reels and all the rest of the trout fisherman's paraphernalia. Holmes also had a shaggy black spaniel in tow. Ah, splendid weather for fishing, eh, Watson? The trout should be fairly jumping at the hook. Yes, I shall have a good opportunity to try that new fly of mine. If that confounded dog doesn't scare the fish away, what in thunder made you bring that spaniel along? You mean Pip? Yes. Down, boy, down. I saw him tied up in the front hall of the inn. Mine host says that they have to keep him on a leash or he runs straight back to his old home. Easy, Pip. Don't pull so, boy. Poor dog seemed to want to go walking, so I said I'd take him. Yes, but a dog on a fishing jaunt, oh, really, Holmes, you... Now, if we were going hunting, it'd be different, eh? Yes, but it's not the hunting season. You never know. We may get in a little hunting before we get to our fishing. Ah, that is the entrance gate to Shoskamo Place, I presume. And some old ironwork. And tightly locked, too. <laughs> Dear Sir Robert, is very jealous of his privacy, eh? You would be, too, if you had a horse you expected to win the derby. I understand he's very vicious with touts or any stranger he catches snooping around his property. I say, look, here comes a big yellow open barouche. Yes, Lady Beatrice returning from her morning's drive, I fancy. I thought we should have some hunting this morning. What do you mean? Pip and I are going to hide behind this hedge. When the footman gets down to unlock the gates, I want you to engage him in conversation. Yes, but I don't understand, Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Where did you go? Here, behind the hedge, trying to keep this confounded dog quiet. Here they come. I say the old girl must be a million years old, all bundled up in shawls and veils and things. That must be Carrie beside her, the one with the suspiciously blonde hair. They've stopped. The footman's getting down off the box. The gates are swinging open. After him, Watson, after him. Hello there. I, I say, my good man, can you tell me how to get to the mill? Now then, Pip, out you go, old boy. It's your mistress. After her, boy. After her. There he goes. He leaps into the carriage onto his mistress's lap. By Jove, he's snarling. He's trying to bite the woman. Get that confounded dog out of here. Drive on. Drive on. Come on, Pip. Did she try to kick you? Well, never mind, old boy. Well, Watson, that's done it. He expected to see his mistress and he found a stranger. Dogs don't make mistakes. But it was the voice of a man. Exactly. Our little hunting party was quite a success. We flushed our bird. Now, come along, Watson. The fish are waiting for us. Look here, Holmes. You're not going to give up this clue. Not exactly. But our hunting must be postponed until after dark. And then, I promise you, it will be for big game. <laughs> Here, Holmes, that storm is going to break any minute now. Hadn't we better get back to the inn? Oh, rubbish. We can reach the chapel before we get too wet. Yes, but how do we get home again? By running, I suspect. We may get wet. I told the landlord to have some of the trout we caught this afternoon and a Stilton cheese, salad, and a hot toddy waiting for us. Oh, then let's get back now. I said we wouldn't be back before half past ten. 
But if we weren't back by then, to rout out the local police. You, you think it's as bad as all that? I don't know. It all depends on what we find in that crypt. There, that, that must be the chapel up ahead. I saw it in the last flash of lightning. Here comes the rain. Run, Watson, run! I say, don't go so fast. Good Lord, it, it's as black as the inside of my pocket. I, uh, I've lost the chapel. No, no, there it is. Over here, Watson, over here. There's an entrance. Right. Oh, great thunder. I, I'm soaked to the skin. It's, it's coming down in torrents. Here, this must be the stairs leading down to the crypt. I say, Holmes, you, you have eyes like a cat. I can't see a blasted thing. Take my hand. Easy now, easy. Don't fall and break your neck. There. Now you can light the lantern. As if I can find a match that's dry enough to light. We all feel like spaghetti. There. Phew. What a sepulchral place. Look at all those vaults. I had no idea Lady Beatrice's husband had so many ancestors. Yes, some of those graves date back before the Norman invasion. Look at the Saxon names. Adalbert, Harold. And here are the Normans. Mm. Long line of Hugos and Odos and Percys. But it's this leaden coffin we're interested in, I imagine. Notice how the dust around it's been disturbed. Uh, Hand me that Jimmy, Watson. You're not going to open it. Holmes, let's get out of here. All, all these coffins, hundreds of dead ancestors, I... I feel like a ghoul myself prying into their long-forgotten secrets. Rubbish. I'll have this lid off in no time. One, two... Stand back! What is the... Keep away from that coffin. Keep back, I say, or I'll blow you to bits. Well, well, if it isn't Sir Robert Norberton himself, this is a surprise. Allow me to present myself. I am... Sherlock Holmes, you don't have to tell me. I heard how you tried to frighten my sister this morning. Now, clear out. Your sister? Yes, my sister. What is your motive? What are you doing here? Answer me, do you hear? I, too, have some questions to ask, Sir Robert. What have you done with your sister? My sister? My sister is home in bed, of course. If your sister's home in bed, would you mind telling me whose body is inside this coffin? Throw back the lid, Watson. There, Sir Robert. Is that the body of your sister, or isn't it? It is. But you're not the official police. What business is it of yours, anyway? My business is that of every good citizen, to uphold the law. What? You mean you'll hand me over to the police? Good Lord, this is terrible. I know appearances are against me, but I couldn't do anything else. Now, let me explain. Your explanations must be to the police, I'm afraid. But that will ruin me, don't you understand? I've always been dependent on my sister, Lady Beatrice, for everything. I'm deeply in debt. If it were known that my sister were dead, my creditors would come down on me like vultures. Everything would be seized, my stables, my horses. Shaskam Prince would never run the derby. Oh, Mr. Holmes, my sister did die just one week ago. She died of dropsy, which had long afflicted her. That will be for the coroner to decide. I was faced with absolute ruin. If I could only keep her death hushed up until day after tomorrow when the derby is run, I I'll make a fortune. If your horse wins. Oh, he will, he must. My good name depends on it. On the first night after my sister's death, knowledge who is Carrie Evans' husband and an actor, helped to carry her body out to the old well house. We were followed, however, by her pet spaniel, who howled all night long. I finally had to get rid of him. And it was Norlet, the actor, who impersonated your sister this last week? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, this last week I've lived the life of the damned. My conscience has given me no peace. Later, we buried my sister's body here, in what is still consecrated ground. One of the tombs of her husband's ancestors. After having endeavored to destroy the ancestors' bones in the furnace. What? I don't know how you know that, but it's true. And now it's for nothing. All for nothing. I'm ruined, Mr. Holmes, ruined. Not necessarily. Well, what do you mean? After all, the derby is only the day after tomorrow. Of course, we must lay the case before the local authorities, but uh, I still have a little influence here and there. Would you? Would you use it? It's not altogether impossible. And now, Dr. Watson, before you tell us Holmes' rather surprising decision in the case of Sir Robert, I'd like to make one more speech on behalf of Clippercraft. Go ahead, Mr. Stark. 
When you advertise anything as extensively as Clippercraft, the product's got to be good. Clippercraft clothes really have to have it, and they have. They're the most amazing clothes you've ever seen at prices so very modest. Remember, Clippercraft suits are only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats only $40, and sport jackets only $26.50. No, you won't find such smart styling and comfort, such rich, long-wearing fabrics, even at far higher prices. They're made possible by the renowned Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 1,036 of the nation's finest stores from coast to coast. So that these great clothes are available to you at your own local independent store, the store you can trust. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now, Dr. Watson, did Sherlock Holmes use his influence in Sir Robert's behalf? Yes, indeed, Mr. Stark. We went back to the inn and Holmes routed the local constable and coroner out of bed. They discussed matters over the trout and coffee and cheese. Luckily, our catch had been a fairly big one. Moreover, the creditors were all Londoners and Sir Robert was a local man. <laughs> Pride of county, you know. And besides, the constable and the coroner had both placed bets on Shoscombe Prince. And they wanted to see him win. And did he? He did, and netted his owner £80,000. Sir Robert paid his debts and bought a small place in the neighborhood of Shoscombe, where he threatens to end his days in an honored old age. He and Holmes have become great friends. Holmes often visits him when he wants a bit of trout fishing. Well, all this uh, talk of trout and salad and cheese has given me the most tremendous appetite. <laughs> I had hoped it would. I have a special treat in store for you tonight. Just ring the bell, will you? I received two of the most beautiful trout from Sir Robert just this morning. I imagine my housekeeper has them in the pan by now. Frying in butter with almonds sprinkled on the top. And a fresh green salad and a Stilton cheese. But, uh, but look here. Isn't it a bit out of season for trout? <laughs> Nothing is out of season these days, Mr. Stark. Sir Robert has what is called a deep freeze, you know. <laughs> yes, I know. But what have you in mind to tell us next week, Dr. Watson? Well, next week, Mr. Stark, I think I'll tell you of the vicious robberies and bludgeonings that occurred in Boston Yard. The criminal, you know, was a cat named Peggy. Holmes always called it the adventure of the wooden claw. The makers of Clippercraft clothes and 1036 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Wooden Claw. Charles Stark speaking for Clippercraft Clothes. This is the world's largest network serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. In just 25 seconds, you'll hear Melvin Elliott reporting the latest news. Fly Eastern Airlines' new type constellation, tried and proven with 300 million passenger miles of dependability. Fly Eastern Airlines.